uh, the golden rule is a fundamental of any two humans working together, much less entire civilizations working together. Mm -hmm. That we all need to treat each other with dignity. We all need to treat each other with respect. And in martial arts, we, we have that as a codified practice. And especially as we explain it, like my students know when you come to the mat and you stop and you bow, you pause. And then you prepare. And the prepare is to get that mindset. It's not just a stop and attention and a bow. It's a mindset shift. Mm -hmm. I am paying attention. I am showing respect. Mm -hmm. And then you proceed, which is, okay, now you step onto the mat and now you practice being your best you. Mm -hmm. But a dojo is a way place. It's the place where the way is practice. Mm -hmm. And your way is practice being your best self. And if all, all that is is quick, yeah, then on, and it's just that stupid formality you have to do <laughs> on your way under the mat, then that there's some utility to it to remind you of the thing, but at least from time to time, you really need to stop and think, what am I saying? And this is a key in my art because it's a life principle. All right, when you do that, think where else does that apply? Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Conversations from the Heart. Today, we are joined by Grandmaster Scott Conway. Grandmaster Conway has been training for over 45 years in martial arts and has published over 56 books and does a myriad other things uh, with his time as well. So, Grandmaster Conway, thanks for joining us on the show this morning. It is a pleasure and an honor to be here. Hey, the honor's all ours. It's a uh... It's just such a great uh, opportunity for us to get to know you a little bit better. Um, we had initially kind of connected on Facebook. You had been talking about doing a tour, going around and visiting some martial arts schools. And I was like, yeah, I would love for you to come and do a seminar at school. And what an awesome opportunity. Um, but, you know, I wanted to get to know you, you a little bit better. And this gives us a little forum to do so. Um, but... Uh, even though I've, I, I read your book you sent me, and I know you're a very accomplished martial artist, mm -hmm. um, I don't know that much about you and how you got started in the martial arts. So would you share with our students that story? Well, I got started in martial arts, like uh, a, a lot of us old masters now that seem like dinosaurs to some of the, the young kids. Um, at one point in time, I was a six-year-old in 1971, holding my mommy's hand as she walked me up to the Dallas YMCA to enroll me in a class. And uh, so, now, back in 1971, we really didn't have much of an idea on how to teach children. So we basically did an adult class with little humans in it. And I don't know that I got through an entire month at any time in my training in those early years without getting at least one bloody nose somewhere. Mm. We, we just didn't know any better. And it was probably the 80s before we really began to realize maybe the way we're teaching kids needs to adjust to like the fact that they're kids they're, and, and they're not tiny adults. And I, I think, you know, industry-wide, we've gotten a lot better at that. And... Uh, without naming the system or the organization, because the story is relevant. As I was a regional director for the Western United States and on a national board of a, another martial art system that was working on its generational continuity, its original uh, uh, master, well, the master that was mastering while I joined had died mm -hmm. and my instructor was now the new head of the system. And so he had formed a national board to help him make decisions. But we had a, a disagreement over what honoring that mandate meant, because to me, it meant making independent decisions based on what I thought was best for the generational continuity of the art, mm. which to me meant, okay, you're the grandmaster now, 
but you weren't a generation before and you won't be a generation from now. So I'm making these kind of larger base decisions. Mm -hmm. To him, you know, very old school, traditional style of honor is you do what the grandmaster says. So to him, I was being dishonorable. Mm -hmm. To me, he was asking me to be dishonorable. Mm -hmm. And so we just had this definitional difference. I defined honor one way. He defined honor a different way. And we ultimately parted ways and I resigned my position and, and, and or he fired me, depending upon uh, one of those classic, you know, I quit, you can't quit, or you can't quit, you're fired type things. That's right. And um, with the help of, I think, 10 grandmasters and system heads, um, I founded Guardian Kempo Kajuko Do, and the other masters helped me and gave me input and feedback and helped train me and occasionally beat me up and, and, you know, and we built a thing. Yes, sir. That's awesome. That's awesome. So what was your original style that you started in? Well, I started doing the, the classic kid thing because, you know, my parents didn't know the jumping around. So there was, you know, some judo, some karate, some taekwondo, some of the various kung fu's. And in fact, to this day, from time to time, I would give students a list of like 18 different styles that I'm reasonably proficient in fighting in the confines of that style. Mm -hmm. uh, because I spent years just kind of jumping around. Mm -hmm. And it was the, the Kempo masters that said like, what you're doing is jumping around doing what we, we already put together. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. And so one of my highest ranks outside of my own style is in Kaju Kembo, which is a contraction of karate, judo slash jujitsu, mm -hmm. uh, kempo, and boxing. Mm -hmm. and, and they said, like, so how about stop doing that because you're going to have to just do what we already did and mm -hmm. come train with us. And I've been doing kempo ever since. So that's so a really... Great place for us to pick up our conversation on intergenerational continuity because, in some ways, it sounds like you are, you know, a jack of many trades. You've gone and you've explored and tried different things and, and, and refined your own sort of pot of tea that you're feeding your students, uh, which is very unique to you and it is something um, not. It, it's coming out of it's arriving from the past, but it's uniquely its own. But on the same breath you were talking about how your master told you to make certain changes and you wanted to keep tradition alive this is what it sounded like so where do you fall on that line because i think it is a it's it's a it, it can be like kind of a balance um between trying to refine the, the discipline to teach the best techniques possible and keeping traditions alive that are very important for passion and um, respect. Well, one of the things I will periodically say is the ancient masters really knew what they were doing. Mm -hmm. Part of the generational continuity issue we run into a lot is a probably mostly Western world American individualistic mindset tendency to look at something of, well, I disagree with it, or I don't understand it. I don't get it. And so we toss it. Mm. Um, the, the way I came up in ranks, if you didn't like a technique or a change that was being made because you thought it was watering something down and ought to be preserved, there was a process you follow. The first step was make sure you're doing it right. And the next step was check in with the senior black belts to make sure you're not missing some subtle nuance. And there's this whole chain of things you go to before you actually challenge the technique. Mm -hmm. And when you challenge the technique, what would that, what that would mean is I would do the attack, the master or grandmaster, some you know, typically eighth, ninth, 10th degree black belt would go full power, full speed to show you how the technique really works. And only after you've run that entire path and you find the technique didn't work, even performed at a master level, then does the technique get set aside. Mm -hmm. So it was always a very, very high standard for the set asides. And, it, and it, you know, it was dangerous to do so if you're the one doing the challenging. And that kind of respect for the tradition of, let me make sure I've got this. Let me make sure I've got this at a high level. 
let me make sure I really understand the depth of it. Let me confirm with the masters I've got this right. Mm -hmm. Then let's pressure test it and see if it really, really works. And only if we've run that entire path and it doesn't work, then we dispense with it, which is very different from, eh, I don't get it. No, eh, that doesn't make sense. Eh, that's old stuff. Toss it. Mm. Yes, sir. And having that standard preserves the tradition and allows an evolution of an art simultaneously. Yeah. I mean, I'm a big believer that at White Belt, you should just put your head down and eat it up. You know, you shouldn't really ask too many questions or think too much because you really have no idea what you're doing. And a lot of times your basic, your base instincts are wrong and you're a, mm -hmm. you can way too easily throw out something that you will come to really respect and understand in the future. How many techniques did you not get when you were white belt that, you know, when you become a black belt, you're like, oh, okay, I see what my master was talking about there. And so I would add a, a third or fourth, or I don't know how many credentials you put in there, like steps to uh, challenge a technique. And that would be, uh, you have to be of some senior rank before you can really start doing that, or you're going to be making mistakes, uh, throwing out techniques that are actually good. And then I'd also throw in an, an extra one, which is never challenge your master right in front of the students. Are you insane? Like, that's that's the surest way to get yourself broken. <laughs> At least that's... Um, yeah, yeah. Actually, and that was part of the protocol, too, is you, you never do it in front of the junior belts. You do that one-on-one -on -one with the masters or just among the black belts. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Yeah. And, and, the, and we all have a discussion about it first before it gets put to the test, because you know, if you're doing something and the reason the, tech, the, the technique doesn't work is because you're not doing it right. Yeah. If something's gonna be as simple as can you put your foot in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. The reason why that twisting motion seems so odd is the left foot is in back, not in front. You're torquing yourself odd. Mm -hmm. And if you're making a, a fundamental error, and you're challenging the technique because the technique is the problem and you find that no no it, it's it's you it's user error the person is doing the technique wrong uh, you want to make sure you catch all of that beforehand and certainly i mean at least in our art the walk to black belt is like a high school graduation you've got the fundamentals hopefully you can read and you can write and you can be proficient in the basics you need to know with life but we wouldn't call someone with a high school diploma educated you, you want to go to them for law or medicine or anything high level. Uh -huh. And the advanced belts and martial arts in our style like roughly correlate to that. Uh -huh. but by the time you reach the master ranks, okay, now we consider you educated. Uh -huh. The uh, first degree black belt, good. Now you're, now you're ready to dive deep. You've got the fundamentals. You're proficient. Uh -huh. If you want understanding, you need mastery. And that's where it goes for us. Oh, absolutely. I agree 100%. I think there's a big misnomer in the martial arts that a black belt, like a first degree black belt or whatever it is, is an expert. And that's just simply not true. A first degree black belt back in the olden days literally just meant that you were a competent competitor. You're someone that we could send out to start competing and developing your skills at a master level, but you're certainly not. Um, but that's a topic maybe for a different uh, <laughs> uh, podcast. But it is, it is skirting on um, this important notion, which I think is like, well, when do you make changes and when do you honor tradition? Because it's, mm -hmm. it is a very um, difficult line to trace. I think in this day and age, it's different than in your generation. It's certainly different in, than in my generation. You're a few years older than me, I think. Um, but even in my generation, the way we looked at martial arts was very different than how we're looking at them now. And mm -hmm. in my generation, we really respected tradition and honored it. Now, in this day and age, it's almost like tradition is a bad thing. And that's really quite sad. And it's almost like we, and I say this all the time, we've thrown out the baby with the bathwater. We've thrown out some of the mm -hmm. best parts of the martial arts because we're worried that it's all bad. And it's, it's not all bad. It's only, there's only a few things that we need to work to refine 
and they're not necessarily bad. But we need to refine those things and make them a little better. But the vast majority of what we have is already very, very good. And so then it poses the question, all right, what can, what should we refine? What should we change? And what should we keep? And I think the, uh, that's, a, that's a very difficult problem to solve. What are your thoughts on that? Well, a lot of it begins with the understanding the tradition and then um, the connection to history that that gives us. I was just sharing in a seminar, like the, the value of horse dance. Mm -hmm. When was the last time you ever saw anyone in anything resembling a fight, whether a point fight, a full contact fight, or a street fight, where they squared up, took a horse dance, and they drilled punches chambering to their hip as they were trying to punch the other guy? That's probably approximately zero. And if you saw one, he probably lost the fight really, really fast. Wow. And we think about why do we do that? Well, part of it goes back to the fact of when you were originally a peasant, your ultimate way out of peasantry was to get into government service and you were trained for, for cavalry. But the problem is you don't have a horse because you're a peasant. But you would want to train so you're ready to do stuff on the horse. So a lot of the kind of odd flourishing movements would have to do with clearing your sleeve and staying on the horse. Well, then even just on a stance wise, when you fight, you usually have like one leg in front, one leg in back, but that's uh, uneven as far as your training goes. So if you drill in horse stance, you build up the strength in both of your legs simultaneously. It maximizes the movements of your hips. So that way you can kind of get a good feel for how the hips move and how your whole, whole torso loosens up as you're doing your technique. And it keeps the strengthening of both legs even on both sides. So you're not having to count, wait, how many reps did we do on that side? How many reps did we do on this side? And the same thing with marching in a uh, forward stance. Is when was the last time you saw someone do a fight where it was step, punch, step, punch, step? I mean, we don't see that in real fights either. But part of the marching drills, especially in a low stance, is we are strengthening our legs. We're building the, the limits of our footwork. And then when we have a real fight, then that helps define our forward limits, our back limits, uh, create our balance. And so we begin to see there's tremendous value in this. There's a reason it started. And then there's a reason why the masters kept it as the world developed around the masters. So even when it was no longer about learning your technique appropriate for being on horseback, they saw like, you know, this, this helps balance the left and the right legs really, really well. This really helps people understand the movement of the hips and understand the movement of the shoulders. And it helps us develop all the skills and techniques that then we take into the fight. Well, if someone just looks at it and goes like, ah, you never fight in a horse stance. You're never going to fight in the marching drill. Toss those things. Just put on the gloves, get in the ring. You're you're missing so much of the core buildups. It's like looking at things like, well, I, I never say my alphabet in order when I'm writing a book. So <laughs> throw out the alphabet. We don't need the alphabet. Okay, but that, that's, you, you start there and you start with subject, verb, and, and depending upon what part of the world you come from and who you're talking to, it sometimes seems subject, verb, swear word. Um, not generally recommended for, from my point of view, but there's some people who, it's not a complete sentence if they haven't included one. But we, we develop these rules and we understand how they work. And then we can build things out of it. Now we can tell stories. Now we can write books. Okay. And in martial arts, the, we, the sentences we write, the stories we write is in our physical movement and our technique, in our self-defense, in our sparring, in our competition, and the things that we do on the street, the way we live our lives that gets built on those fundamentals. Mm -hmm. And so if you preserve a thing, then... The word we would use around uh, my dojo whenever we were making shifts is an upgrade. And so if it's going to be different just because it's different, that's no reason to change it. If it's going to be a slight upgrade, a mild upgrade, meaning this is a little bit better than that, well, you still do the tradition and you teach these as variations. Mm -hmm. Only if something is a meaningful upgrade to the point where doing it the old way is no longer functional, do we actually, actually change anything. And our preference is to maintain the, the system continuity so that we all know what we're doing 
And if someone comes back after 10 years or 20 years, it's fundamentally the same. And where the thing is different, they're like, oh, I see, that's, that's really good. That's much better. I see why that got added in. Or the, if they ask, well, what about this? And, and they can see why it got taken out. Yeah. So, I'm curious about the kind of codification of those upgrades. We were talking yesterday or a couple of days ago to some Aikido practitioners, some Aikido masters, and they used the term expansion, right? They said their students would sometimes say, oh, you're just changing things on us. And they said, no, <laughs> we're not changing. We're not just changing, we're expanding. And my, my question is, how does that become codified um, in terms of the passing down, right? When, when a, so for example, you know, say if you're changing a block and you say, actually, we've been doing it way A for so long and over testing, over pressure testing, we've arrived at this alternative way B, if you will. Does that get written down somewhere? Do you make notes in a kind of grand catalog that says, we did it this way up to this point and then we started doing it better, but we won't forget way A. I, I'm curious just for, for documenting purposes, for digging in, you know, people in 200 years being able to <laughs> research and pick through the files. That's something I really enjoy about the martial arts, being able to pick through and say, ooh, you know, the story you told about the horseback riding stance, you know, that is, that's yeah, what is your, somewhere. what is your process mm -hmm. for developing technique mm -hmm. and, and integrating into your system uh, in a meaningful way that's passed on to the next generation? Well, part of it for us is everything's written down at, at least up to a certain level. So um, I, I think the dojo book that I sent you is like the introduction book that we would send to or give to someone who came in inquiring about classes. That's what, what the white belts would start with. But there's um, a thicker book, a couple of hundred pages on dojo stuff. If they're coming up in a karate program, there's a couple of hundred page book focused just on karate. Same thing with our jujitsu program, same thing with our cobra jitsu program. And in the book also includes just a move list. Um, mm -hmm. This is the sequence. Now, it's not detailed enough for someone to come back in 200 years and look at it like, oh, I now understand that kata. Yes, sir. But for someone who already knows it, and they're going, oh, was, <sighs> what do I do next? They can look it up. Like, oh, no wonder my feet were all messed up. I missed a kick. Mm -hmm. And that, that helps them keep that clean and keep that clear. As we move things forward and we do make those kind of changes, we always write down what we're doing and why we're doing it. And some of the, and we'll still talk about what we used to do and why we did it that way and why we do it differently now. Mm. Uh, in, in particular, there was one technique, it was out of our, what's currently punch technique number five, that after a flurry of blows, the last move was either a punch to the face, but if the head turned that way, uh, then it changed, you, you rolled it over for a, an upside down, inverted, uh, upside down vertical punch to the temple, and if the head rolled the other way, then it turned into an outside knuckle. Well, I could do it. Oh, the black belts could do it, but at the rank you learned it at, you go, what the, how are you supposed to even know what's going on in time to make the adjustment? And what had happened is I happened to be sitting next to uh, Joseph Estronic, who was one of the nation's top uh, combat sports physicians of the time, and we were watching a Krav Maga technique, which they were executing with punches, even though they would do it with palm strikes. And I was looking at that thinking, you know, if you do that with punches to the head exactly like that, you will break your hand. Said, but before I said anything, I leaned over to Dr. Esronik and asked him what he thought of the technique and says, well, it's a very effective technique if you don't mind breaking your hand. I thought, okay, so I'm, I'm reading it the same way as the doctor. But then I th went to the next level and go, do I do that somewhere? And I did. And so we'll talk about Here's what the technique used to be and why you would make those adjustments and how those adjustments would solve the problems that would arise. And so, but we changed it because the level of awareness of the detail in order to be able to make the on the fly movement of the hand to go for your target properly required too much experience to be effective for years after learning it. 
So we changed it to a palm strike because of the head's facing you, palm strike in the nose, if the head turns, palm strike in the, the jaw, the head turns the other way, palm strike in the jaw on the other side. And, and then it doesn't matter how the head moves. As we developed a greater understanding that head strikes are the least predictable part of anything you can do. If you open with a head strike, you know the head is where the head was when you started. But if you go <laughs> and, and after, you know, six hits of the body moving, you don't know where that head's going to be. If you hit me, I don't know where my head's going to be. If you hit me three times, I definitely don't know where my head's going to be. How are you going to know where my head's going to be? And so adjusting where you just have to follow the mass, solve the problem that then lowered the level of mastery required to be effective with the technique. And so you look at that and go, okay, so what are we solving? We're, we're increasing its effectiveness at a much, much lower rank. We're taking away the probability you will damage your own hand executing exactly that technique. And there was no downside. Mm -hmm. So you go, okay. The closest you would have to a downside is like, well, because it simplified the technique, you don't need as high a level of mastery to do it. Well, in the years since learning that technique, you're gonna have plenty of places where you will be developing higher levels of mastery at higher level techniques anyway. Mm -hmm. So losing it in this one particular spot wasn't diminishing the overall mastery of the black belts. It was just making that one spot easier. Mm -hmm. And then we, we wrote all that down and that's what's now in the books. And if someone wanted to look at some of the old versions, if they have some of the old books and the, the old like uh, typewritten, printed, laser printed, stapled versions of stuff that you can still sometimes find in some of our boxes. You can say like, oh, that changed. Oh, I see there was this old, whole explanation about what you do and then it just changed to a palm strike. Oh, I see why that happened. Mm -hmm. And that's the way we handle the documentation. But that also then reflects that level of that, or how high we put the bar on when we make the change. Mm -hmm. that we saw that this was creating a problem and can we still solve all the problems the technique solves in a way that it solves the one piece that's still a problem mm -hmm. and then we codify that new one and then we pass down that new one but there's always an explanation when we teach it and then i'll tell people okay this is how this technique goes it used to be this which is really cool and if i'm in a fight i might still do the really cool older version but if you're not a senior rank black belt, you'll probably break your hand trying. And that's why now it's this. Yeah, that's, uh, that's great. Well, that's a really in-depth look at your process there for sure. Thank you. Um, my process is a little maybe more simple, but if I, if I detect something in a technique that I've been working on that I'm like, hmm, this this isn't working the way I would like it to work. And a lot of times it's passed down to me in that form from my master because he didn't know the absolute best way to employ that technique either. And, or maybe that technique just isn't that good. And there's a better way that I'm searching for that I'm like, hmm, I just feel like there's, there's gotta be a better way to do this. I will start working it into my sparring and I will start trying to get it to work. And then when I do discover how to get it to work, then I will start um, teaching in class. And when I teach in class, I'll start saying, oh, okay. Like I'll learn things from the teaching part too. And then I will go back and I'll spar and I'll teach and I'll kind of roll this around a bit. And then, you know, sometime later, sometimes a month, sometimes years later, I will uh, codify it into curriculum and I'll start teaching it. And then if the curriculum, there, when it becomes curriculum, it's really, it's taught all the time. So you can really see the nuance of it. Mm -hmm. And you start saying, okay, this is good curriculum. This is bad curriculum. And then the best curriculum wins. And you just kind of keep refining in this, this manner. That's kind of how I develop my technique and, and improve my curriculum at the academy. Um, but yeah, it, it's, uh, it's definitely a nuanced uh, topic. And I think that it pairs well with what we're talking about because it's like that is an, a really important uh, process to go through as a martial artist. Mm -hmm. And you need to do that to have the best curriculum possible. 
but it's like, how do we do that without stepping on toes, without being disrespectful to the last generation, without dropping off the really important um, truths that maybe we ourselves are missing from the generation before, you know, because even despite all my years of training, I might, and all that uh, process of sort of refining the technique, I might miss out on a few truths that my master had discovered that are eluding me. And then I, I failed to pass those on to the next generation. So I'm a big believer in actually not throwing out techniques, but mm -hmm. focusing on other techniques more. Okay. So it's like, I really feel like almost anything you do mm -hmm. could be a weapon and could do some damage to somebody. I once had a, a lady who taught me when I was studying Tai Chi that you, this motion in Tai Chi was a block. And I said, well, how are you blocking? She says, the person's punching and you're blocking with your arm like this. And I thought, wow, that seems like a really good way to break your arm in my head, you know, but I was being respectful. And I just said, yes, ma'am. I had many, many years of experience in martial arts when, when she was teaching me this, but I just said, yes, ma'am. And, you know, to be totally honest with you, it's not, if here's the most effective technique, it is probably one of the <laughs> least effective things you can do, like way down here. But it has some effectiveness. Like if I, if, if my hand was here and someone punched me, there's a chance that it could, it could block mm -hmm. on my arm and that would do less damage mm -hmm. than any of my solar plexus, right? Like there's like some effectiveness to it, right? So everything has some effectiveness at some level. And I don't like this sort of elitist mindset of like, this is just garbage. We're going to throw it out because this technique mm -hmm. is just slightly better. Instead, what I'll say is like, well, this one is most high. It, for me, is more high probability with submission, but you know these are both viable submissions, and, and the lower probability submissions can be more sneaky because people aren't doing them as often, so they surprise you. Um, yeah, I, I think one, you want to go ahead, sir. This is one, one of the interesting things, like about that in particular, is I've been attending um, martial arts conventions for a while. I used to teach back in the NAT my days. National Association of Professional Martial sure. Artists back in the 90s and uh, go to Las Vegas for the Martial Arts Industry Association's MA Super Show. Sure. And one of the things we see in a lot of the seminars are the people who show up to train with a master, mm -hmm. but instead of doing the technique, the master teaches them and said, well, the way we do it in our school is. Mm -hmm. And then they're working amongst themselves on what they already know instead of learning what it is they're doing and, and what I've always taught my students is just go learn their way kind of like you did with the Tai Chi instructor and then we'll we'll break it down later and see what we can extract from it that would be useful yes like in that particular case you go like would you if someone's actually punching at you are you ever going to block that way <laughs> like, like if if you don't care what happens to your arm okay sure but then we might look at that and say, but what might it be used? Well, it might be useful to jam them before they punch. So if both of their hands are up and you can jam their hands into themselves, like, okay, that could be useful. Now you might be awfully close to them before you're doing that. Mm -hmm. And then we would build an answer. And what else could you, well, if you jam them in and then you could hook it and clear it and strike with the other side. And, and so it creates all these other options that maybe we wouldn't have thought of. We're not using the technique exactly the way that we were told the technique was, but we're going, okay, I can see some places that I might have some utility. And sometimes, like in a case like that, we can say, like, and I can see how someone not training in fighting mm -hmm. might have misunderstood what some master somewhere down the line said. That, that's a okay. really good example of why the white belt shouldn't be developing their own technique, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yes, and hey, I've even seen showdowns developing their technique and go, you are not my student. <laughs> Please tell me you did not use the reasoning that I taught you to arrive at that technique. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and sometimes what it is, is, you know, they see stuff in movies and they think, oh, well, this would be really cool. And I do this and I do a spinning hook kick. And yes. it's like, well, like, <laughs> yes, that's cool. Yes, that looked awesome. Please don't do that in self-defense. But um, it... Even then, though, some of these fancy moves, they're good to know as buildups and to develop your overall skill and agility and to understand how your whole body moves. But you're probably not going to open with a, you know, a flying spinning kick in a fight. Mm -hmm. But they're, they're cool to know. 
And, you know, you want, want me to hold a board for you because you want to show me your fancy break. That's awesome. Totally up to doing that. And just know what the thing is for and have some understanding of what it's not for and practice it for what it is and don't practice it for what it isn't. Absolutely. Like, don't block punches like that. But you can jam someone's, like, hands up like that if you want to. That'll work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I guess that kind of brings us to this other question that I've been sort of circling around, but I'm trying to figure out the words to articulate it. Um, there are certain things that I feel like are timeless. Respect, mm -hmm. discipline, how they manifest in the floor with bowing, passing things with two hands, saying yes, sir, that I feel like we should never get rid of because they're what make the martial arts so strong. They're what separate us from the wolf. It's, they're what make us the sheepdog. They, they make us stand above the attackers of the weak and the innocent that we're trying to defend it, and, and make what we do a noble path. Um, what are your thoughts on the martial arts and how it's been going? Because as I've seen it, you know, there's kind of these two camps. One camp is the traditional martial artists and a lot of them have kind of gone underground and really solidified in their dogma. And then the other camp is the MMA crowd that have kind of thrown out all of that respect and discipline and traditional elements and are just folks on fighting. You know, like I remember back in the early 2000s, I started to get students coming and said, I'm not a martial artist, I'm a fighter. And I really dislike that terminology. And I think we're actually now at a point where this group of traditional martial artists that sort of put their head in the sand are almost obsolete. There's, I mean, there's, there's very, not I, obsolete might not be the right word, almost unexistent. There's, there's not that many of them left. A lot of these people have decided to kind of embrace things, but I, I feel like there's now just way too many mixed martial artists who are teaching martial arts without the respect and discipline that it's very common to find people who've learned in martial arts without first having to put on the funny pajamas and say mm -hmm. yes sir and do all of that stuff which really makes you come out the other side as a net positive to our society instead of a net negative you know where you're someone who's going to be enriching our society by uh, being respectful and kind and polite and not someone who's using their physicality to push people around puffing out your chest that kind of thing um, so in my mind, that is the reason why I articulate this whole sort of narrative of the martial arts is because in my mind, that's the most important thing to preserve. Like we can't, maybe how we express that, it might be a little different, you know, in Kung Fu, you know, do that and Taekwondo, we bow and maybe some martial art you salute or something like that. But that essence is very, very important to preserve. What are your thoughts? I, I absolutely agree with the importance of the essence. And so much of it has to do with, it's a way of being, which then becomes a way of living. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> years ago, I had a couple come to me, both of them trained in a, a very aggressive, what, what I would call a fighting art rather than a martial art. And they were having some marital problems. And since I'm also a pastor, people would come to me for, for stuff like that. It didn't take long to realize what was happening is they were engaging in conflict in their home exactly the same way they trained in the dojo. And they hadn't realized how their way of being in the dojo of defeat your enemy, that the, the, form, the formality of the bow and such before class was just sort of the ceremonial thing you just do to get out of the way so you can do the real stuff. And the husband in particular didn't seem to understand why his wife was still mad. <laughs> because the, the fight's over. He goes, okay, fight's over. I win. I, w I was the biggest, the loudest, the meanest, and the most powerful, and I beat you down, and I, I win the fight. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't know how she can't just respect the fact that I won the fight. Mm -hmm. Well, on her side, uh, you were mean. You were cruel. You were judgmental. The, did you hear the words that came out of your mouth? Did, do you seriously believe those things? And it's a very kind of MMA competitive Cobra Kai, well, old, I haven't seen much of the Cobra Kai currently, but original Karate Kid Cobra Kai mentality, like no mercy to the enemy. It's like, oh, I am fighting with my wife. No mercy to my wife. 
except that you still want to have a relationship afterwards. Mm-hmm. And the classical martial arts, grounded in a lot of the philosophical and religious practices of the East, where you are showing respect for someone not just right here in the moment to be nice to them, but because it was part of the culture. This is how we maintain civilization. Mm -hmm. The the golden rule is a fundamental of any two humans working together, much less entire civilizations working together. Mm -hmm. That we all need to treat each other with dignity. We all need to treat each other with respect. And in martial arts, we, we have that as a codified practice and especially as we explain it, like my students know when you come to the mat and you stop and you bow, you pause and then you prepare. And the prepare is to get that mindset. It's not just a stop and attention and a bow. It's a mindset shift. Mm-hmm. I am paying attention. I am showing respect. Mm-hmm. And then you proceed, which is, okay, now you step onto the mat and now you practice being your best you. Mm-hmm. But a dojo is a way place. It's the place where the way is practice. Mm-hmm. And your way is practice being your best self. And if all, all that is is quick, yeah, then on, and it's just that stupid formality you have to do <laughs> on the way under the mat, then th- th- there's some utility to it to remind you of the thing. But at least from time to time, you really need to stop and think, what am I saying? And this is a key in my art because it's a life principle art. When you do that, think where else does that apply? Because when I go home, and I've used this example often, when I go home as a lawyer and I had this God awful opposing counsel on one of those last nightmare cases I have. If you want an idea how horrible this man was to work against in the legal system, the case took five years. He was such a character that in large part, as a result of how he handled what we were fighting over, he went to federal prison and he got disbarred. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine how frustrating this person is to work with. The lawyer that can handle that kind of thing, is that who you want coming home as husband and as father? Probably not. Do you want that man showing up being the one on the mat? Also, probably not. At some level, you want me to show up and be the martial artist when I step on that mat. Mm -hmm. Well, at home, it's the same thing. Pause before I walk, go in the house, Mm -hmm. mentally prepare, get drop the lawyer fighting the opposing counsel. Mm -hmm. Walk in this door, proceed as husband and father and practice being the best husband I know how to be, practice being the best father I know how to be create that shift. Same thing when I go to work. If if I was having some problems at home, Mm -hmm. I go into work, okay, let's pause. What am I doing here? If I'm teaching martial arts, if I'm practicing law, if I'm doing my pastoring, whatever my role is here, prepare mentally for this, then proceed into it and practice being my best pastor, my best uh, martial arts instructor, my best lawyer. And it all grounds on that simple formality that we then pass down the generations of this is why you stop you are changing your location and your role is different in this location every location you go where you have a role ground yourself in that role and then proceed into that space and practice being your best version of you in that role Mm -hmm. And the more I think our students understand and we understand the the weight of the principle that we're learning and how meaningful it is and how vivid it is and how it shows up in so many areas of life, then all of that takes on a whole different level of meaning. And, and this part's important, gets much more difficult for someone to later just dismiss. But, oh, yeah, that's just a thing we did. Yeah, when I was a kid, and I, but I did this, like, physical activity thing, and they always made us do this thing. Mm. But then it grounds them in meaning, and it lets them know you are having a conversation with yourself. Same thing when we fight. And, and this is what I worked with the, with the couple, because they were wondering why my wife and I didn't seem to have these kind of fights. I said, well, when we spar, attention, battle, fighting, stance, fight. 
look simple enough, but it's a conversation. We know it's a conversation. The tension is I am paying attention to my partner. And our bow is humility, know your proper place, power, power to control yourself, humility over power. We are partners, not opponents. Stepping back is I do not want to hurt you and being in our fighting stances and I am ready to trade. And at the end of our protocols, it's similar in reverse, ending with a, a hug with two pats, which means I forgive you if you hurt me, or I'm sorry if I hurt you, and I forgive you if you hurt me. Hmm. And so when my wife and I would then come to conflict, because two human brains will sometimes have different ideas, we come to our disagreement with, I'm paying attention to you. I know my proper place, that I am your husband, we are partners. I will exercise my power, the power to control myself with my proper place telling me how to control myself because we are partners, not opponents. I don't want to hurt you. I want to solve this problem. And at the end, the mentality, including all the same things, like I was trying to pay attention, remember my proper place, control myself within my proper place as partners, not opponents. And I'm sorry if I... Uh, sorry if I hurt you and I forgive you if you hurt me. And the exact same sparring protocol, the language of protocols, a conversation we are literally having, I literally teach the conversational meaning to our students so they understand what we're doing. And you take that home and you do that with your husband, with your wife, with your kids, with your parents, with your friends, with your boss, with your employees, that exact same approach to conflict then becomes a life principle that to hand down and then to pass on to the next generation. That's awesome. I mean, I feel like couldn't end on a better note than the sage wisdom from Grandmaster Conway. Um, I really liked what you were saying about, you know, pausing at the door and showing respect and reframing your mind. Like this is, this is your chance to practice the way the way of the martial arts and how you can use that in every aspect of your life to be a better father, to be a better son, and all those myriad of manifestations. Mm -hmm. um, Grandmaster Conway, thank you so much for coming on. It's been a real pleasure. I feel like I've gotten to know you a little bit better, and I'm really excited and honored to have you come visit us and do a seminar at some point in the future when we can work that out in your busy mm -hmm. schedule and your long journey that you're on right now. <laughs> well, I certainly look forward to that and it will be my privilege to be on your floor teaching. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. If you enjoyed that podcast, please consider liking and subscribing to our YouTube channel, as well as hitting the notification bell. We offer in-person group and private lessons at our facility in Kyle, Texas, as well as virtual lessons anywhere in the world. If you'd like to learn more about our programs, you can find us online at risingphoenixtkd.com.